In the next few sessions, I'd like to examine the basis for risk and how it shows up in your investing strategy. In this session, I want to focus on the easier instrument for measuring risk, which is bonds. If you're an investor in bonds, I'd like to think about what the risks are you face as an investor and how you might be able to measure those risks. So let's think about it. You're investing in a conventional bond. A conventional bond, of course, is a bond where the coupon rate is set up front and the maturity is known, a 10-year, 5% coupon bond. Think about the two risks you face. The first is even if you're guaranteed those coupons and the face value at the end of the life of the bond, which is the conventional practice, the, the value of those coupons and the face value could shift over time depending on what happens to interest rates. Put differently, if interest rates go up, the same coupons are worth less than they were before, in, before interest rates went up. The second risk you face, of course, with the bond is that the entity that promised you these fixed payments, the coupons and the face value, might not deliver. That's default risk. So let's start with the easier of these two risks, interest rate risk. It is true that the coupon and the face value in a bond is set at the time of issue. So you know exactly what it is you know, in most bonds. You could, of course, have floating rate bonds and, and con convertible bonds. We'll come back and talk about those in a minute. But a conventional bond, the coupon rate, the face value, and the maturity are known at the time the bond is issued. However, the value of the bond will be a function of how much you value those coupons and face value. So even though the dollar value of the coupons and face value remain the same, the present value, the value that you're willing to pay for those coupons, will change as interest rates change. Thus, if interest rates go up, the present value of those coupons and face value will go down. And if interest rates go down, the present value will go up. The price of the bond will shift over time, even if there's no default risk. Here's a very simple example. Let's assume you have a 4% coupon 10-year bond. So basically, and let's keep things simple. Let's assume the coupons are paid once every year. Normal bonds, you might get two coupons a year, but that doesn't change the mechanics of what we're going to do. So we're going to keep it as $40 every year for the next 10 years. And at the end of the 10th year, you're going to get $1,000 plus the 40. So if you look at the second column in the table, you'll actually see my promised cash flows of $40 every year for the next nine years. In the 10th year, you get the $40 plus the face value back. Here's what I've done in this table. I've computed the value of those fixed coupons and face value as a function of what the market interest rate is. If the market interest rate is 4%, let's pick the middle column, then the value of the bond is exactly equal to the face value. So that's a bond that's, that, that trades at par. It trades at face value. If the interest rate is 2%, though, it's dropped from when the bond was issued, the present value of your cash flows, even though they're exactly the same cash flows, is 1,180 million. Your bond goes up in value 18% if interest rates go from 4 to 2%. If they go to 3%, the value of the bond increases from 1,000 to 1,085. That's an 8.5% increase in value. However, if interest rate starts rising above 4%, the bond actually starts to drop below par. So a bond that trades above par will have a coupon rate that exceeds a market interest rate. A bond that trades at below par, in this case at a 5% interest rate, the present value of the coupons and the face value gives you $923. That's a drop of about 7.7% from the par value. That bond trades at a discount because the market interest rates exceeds a coupon rate. And at 6%, the bond drops even more. In fact, the degree to which the bond price changes as a function of the interest rates is of interest any time you buy a bond. So if you think about what drives how sensitive a bond price is to changes in interest rates, there are two factors that feed in. One is how much do you get in coupons each period? The more you get in coupons, the less sensitive your bond price is going to be to changes in interest rates. The reason is very simple. The more you get in coupons, the more cash flows you collect early on the bond, and the less you worry about the $1,000 at the end because it's a lesser proportion of the overall cash flows. So the level of coupons matter. Second, the maturity of the bond matters. The longer the maturity of the bond, so if you have a 30-year bond instead of a 10-year bond, the more sensitive it is going to be to interest rate changes. So often bond buyers look for a composite measure, a measure that captures the, the interest rate risk of a bond, and that measure is called duration. So when you hear the term duration in the context of a bond, it can be read in one of two ways. It's a weighted average maturity of when the cash flows come into the bond. So if you take the cash flows in a bond and you take a weighted average of when you get the cash flows in the bond, that's one way to think about duration. Here's a far more interesting way. The duration of a bond is actually a measure of the interest rate risk in the bond. So the higher the duration of the bond, more, the more sensitive it is to changes in interest rates. 
So how is duration computed? There are lots of different ways, some more sophisticated than others. This is the simplest measure of duration. It's called Macaulay duration. And here's what you do to compute the duration of that four-year bond that we just valued you know, just a couple of pages ago. So this is the four-year coupon bond. The face value is $1,000. And the market interest rate right now is 5%. So you come to me and say, look, I'd like to know the duration of the bond now. Here's what I do. In the second to last column, I do what I did two pages ago and compute the present value, and I come up with 922.78. In the last column, here's what I do. I take the present value in each year, and I multiply it by when the cash flow comes in. So the cash flow in year one gets multiplied by one. The cash flow, the present value in year two gets multiplied by year two. And in the last column, I keep a running tab of, the, of that number. If I accumulate the very last column, I get 7.714 billion. How do you read that? Don't read that number by itself, but if I divide the 7,714 by the 922, I get 8.36. That's the duration of this bond. And there, as I said, two ways to read it. If you look at the cash flows on this bond, the weighted average duration of when you get those cash flows is 8.36 years. It's not quite 10 because even though the bond has a maturity of 10 years, you get cash flows up front. If I increase the coupon rate on this bond to 6% 6 or 8%, that duration will decrease. The second way to think about the bond, and more interesting way, is this number is a measure of how much interest rate risk there is in this bond. You say, what do I do with that 8.36? If I gave you a second bond with a duration of 15 years, this bond is less sensitive because it has a duration of 8.36 than the, duration, than the bond with a duration of 15 years. Only zero coupon bonds have durations equal to maturity because then the only cash flow you get is at maturity. If you have a coupon bond, your duration will generally be less than your maturity and the larger the coupon, the bigger the difference will be. So that's interest rate risk. There's a second risk though. When you buy a bond, there's an entity out there promising to make those fixed payments. If that entity has no default risk, you're guaranteed the payments. But if that entity has default risk, it's a corporate or a sovereign that you don't trust, then there is a chance you will not get your payments, right? Your best case scenario is you get your promised payments. That's, that's, your, that's your best scenario. But there are lots of worse scenarios. You might, the, the entity might miss a couple of coupon payments or worse still, it might never make a payment to you, in which case you buy a bond and you get nothing in return. So when you invest in a bond, you have to worry about default risk and you have to price it in. You can't wait to be surprised. So let's think about the variables in an entity that will determine how much default risk you're exposed to. So you buy a corporate bond and you're trying to figure out how much default risk you're exposed to. You're probably going to look at that, that company's capacity to generate cash flows. The more cash flows a company can generate and the more stable those cash flows are, the less the default risk in the company. So if you buy Coca-Cola bonds, you can look at those cash flows and they're huge. And the fact that the company has very stable earnings and you say, hey, there's not that much default risk in a Coca-Cola bond. It also depends on what other commitments that company has made. So if you have a company that's made a ton of commitments in the sense of it's borrowed money from other people, it has uh, contractual commitments to suppliers, uh, employees, whatever. If those fixed commitments are large, they offer a competing claim on the cash flow. So the more fixed commitments a company has in addition to yours, the greater the default risk. So as an example, if you buy bonds issued by the gap, you might look at the earnings and say, that's pretty good. You might look at the, the stability of earnings and say, that's pretty good. But then you're going to be looking at those lease commitments that the gap has entered into and say, that's not that good. That increases my default risk. So those factors go into the assessment of default risk. And you say, how do I come up with a measure for it? Well, banks have been doing this for 700 years or 800 years for, or as long as they've been lending money. They've been trying to come up with credit risk scores. And you and I have all uh, have probably been exposed to the same thing when we apply for a credit card, where you look at a company's history, you look at its capacity to pay money, and you attach a score to it. In the last 100 years in the U.S., you've also had ratings agencies, S&P, Moody's, Fitch, there are, there, are, there are quite a few, that assess companies and try to attach a rating to a company. Ratings are usually not numerical, they're usually alphabetical. S&P and Moody's rate companies from AAA, that's the safest company, all the way down to D. This is a company in default. The advantage of having a rated company is you have a sense at least of what the ratings agencies think of the default risk of the company. The danger, of course, is ratings agencies do make mistakes. But if you are buying a bond issued by a company, you almost always will be able to find a rating for that company. Let me back up. You don't need a bond rating to issue a bond, but most companies that issue bonds have a rating. 
And the advantage of having a rating, if you trust the ratings agency, is that rating will give you a sense of how much of a spread you would charge over, the, over what you charge on something risk-free to buy that bond. It's called a default spread. Let me put some numbers here. At the start of 2013, this is what the default spreads for different ratings classes look like for one-year bonds, five-year bonds, 10-year bonds, and 30-year bonds. So let's assume you're thinking about buying a triple B rated bond today. Let's say the, the, the risk-free rate for a 10-year bond right now is 1.5%. 1. 1. So you know if you bought a bond with guaranteed cash flows today with a 10-year life, you'd, you'd demand a 1.5% rate. But let's say you're buying a triple B bond today. The default spread on this bond is 1.84%. How would you use that? You'd add the 1.84% to the 1.5% guaranteed rate. And the total rate you get of 3.34% is the interest rate you would demand for buying that bond. So in the case of bonds, that becomes the simplest mechanism for bringing in default, default risk is to find a rating for the company and use that rating to come up with a spread that you add on to what you think a reasonable risk-free rate is to get a measure of how much you would demand for investing in that bond. Now, of course, the ratings agencies are not magicians. They don't come up with these ratings from nothing. They actually look at the financials. They look at a bunch of ratios and they actually give away the game. I pull these ratios off the S&P website because they actually report the averages for these numbers for the companies that they rate. So the way to read this, for instance, is there is a ratio called the interest coverage ratio. We take the earnings before interest and taxes or operating income and divide by interest expense. So this table, to the degree that you believe this table, S&P says the average AAA rated company had an interest coverage ratio of 17 and a half. Double A company, the interest coverage ratio is 10.8, and you can see the ratio as the ratio declines, the rating reflects it. And there are other rates, so the EBITDA coverage ratio is a variant on the interest coverage ratio. We use EBIT, the earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So if you're interested, you can actually go see the definitions of these ratios on the SP website. But my point is, that the ratings agencies base their ratings primarily on ratios. They use qualitative information, but it's prim primarily financial information. What I'm trying to say is if you do end up buying a bond from a company that's not rated, which is very unusual, or lending money to a company that's not rated, which is much more common, even if there's no rating, you might be able to fill in the gap using these ratios. I actually use a very simplistic version of this process where I look at one ratio the interest coverage ratio. As I said, the interest coverage ratio is earnings before interest and taxes, or operating income as it's often called in income statements, divided by the interest expense. As an example, if you have a company with $3.5 billion in operating income and $700 million in interest expenses, its interest coverage ratio is 5. You're saying, what do I do with this? I have, I've actually created a lookup table where I've looked at rated companies and essentially created a table where if you tell me what the coverage ratio is, I can tell you what rating goes with that coverage ratio. This is what the lookup table, for instance, looked like at the start of 2013. So you tell me your interest coverage ratio, in this case, 5. The interest coverage ratio of 5, if you're a small market cap company, and you can see interest coverage ratio. So basically, I have two sets of ratios, one for small companies and one for large companies. Why? Because larger companies seem to get away with having lower ratios and having higher ratings with those ratios. So if your interest coverage ratio is five and you're a small market cap company, the rating I would assign you would be A minus. You're saying, what next? The default spread that would have gone with the rating at the time that I put this table together was 3%. So if you're lending to a company with an interest coverage ratio of five, you would charge 3% more than the risk-free rate to lend to that company or buy bonds issued by the company. So let's review. When you buy a bond, you're generally guaranteed fixed payments, or no, you're not guaranteed, you're promised fixed payments over a certain period of time because the maturity is known and the face value at the end. With a bond, even though those payments are fixed, you're still exposed to two risks. One is that the level of interest rates might change because as interest rates go up and down, the value of your bond will shift. And that's why we use duration to measure interest rate risk. And the other is you might be exposed to default risk, which is the entity that made those promises might not deliver. And that entity risk we capture in a default spread. Just as an aside, those are conventional bonds. Increasingly, if you go to the bond market, you're going to be assaulted, if that's the right word, by variations on this thing. You could have a floating rate bond. You're saying, what's a floating rate bond? A floating rate bond is a bond where the coupon rate gets reset each year based upon some trigger rate. It could be the prime rate, the T-bond rate, it could be LIBOR. Basically, your coupon rate will change over time. 
The nice thing about buying a floating rate bond is you're less exposed to interest rate risk. Do you see why? Because if interest rates go up, the coupon rate in your bond will go up. So floating rate bonds protect buyers from interest rate risk, but in return, you might have to settle for a lower interest rate. You could have convertible bonds where you can convert the bond into stock at any point in time. Of course, you'll do it only if stock prices go up above a certain level. But in a convertible bond, you basically have two securities. You have the straight bond, which we've talked about in this presentation, plus what's called a conversion option, which is a call option. That's more, that's a different kind of instrument. But that's, so the value of a convertible bond is the sum of those two. You really have to be able to value that call option to answer the question, is this the right bond for me? So it's really a discussion for a different forum. So generally speaking, if you understand how a conventional bond works, you've got 80% or 90% of bond pricing fixed. The rest often requires that we kind of deal with these options that are built into bonds. Some bonds are callable, some are convertible, you know, some are fixed rates, some are floating rates, some have caps, others have floors. That does make life more complicated, but let's get the basics nailed down in this particular session. Thank you very much for listening.